herbal noise. All right. Okay. Got you back. Okay. In three, two. My name is Doug Downs. Just before we get started this episode, Spotify Wrapped came out this past week, and we heard from a, a few people actually that our little podcast was their number one for the year, which is absolutely amazing. I can't tell you how excited I was to get those notes. So thank you to Jennifer Grundler, Sissy Laframboise. Sissy, I hope I'm saying that right. And Kelly Edmund for sending us a note on that. We're going to send each a small gift in the mail just to thank them. My guest this week is Tim Conrad joining today from Kamloops, BC. Tim, have you looked at your Spotify wrapped or unwrapped yet, whatever it's called? Yeah, I did. Uh, I'm a I'm a all over the place. Uh, 1,500 artists, over 3,100 songs. But Dave Ooh. Matthews Band finished at the top this year, uh, probably I would say again, and uh, Classified number two, and the Beatles number three. So a little bit of interesting. Everything. My number one was the Rolling Stones again. It's kind of just predictable, but somehow Enya was in my top three. Yeah, well, I've been hijacked. <laughs> That's all I'm saying is I've I've been hijacked. <laughs> My account's been hijacked. You're in Kamloops, right? Which is part of the the beautiful area of BC's interior, prone to some wildfires in the summer. How's Kamloops today? Well, Kamloops is good. Um, it, we're we're on probably the last day that you'll be able to say that you could go mountain biking and st snowboarding <laughs> on the same day. Um, <laughs> uh, we're getting some snow, I think, tonight. So, um, and I'm looking forward to getting some laps in soon. So, yeah, it's a great great little spot uh, if you're looking for. Uh, fun to be had outdoors. This is this is paradise here. Any time of year. Yeah, absolutely. Tim, yeah. you've held leadership roles in emergency management, communications, and post-disaster engagements in some of Canada's largest emergencies, including the 2023 wildfires in BC's Caribou, Squamish, Lillooet, and Columbia Shushwap regions. I struggle with that word, Shushwap. Hope I got through it healthcare, and post-secondary education during the COVID-19 pandemic. You received the prestigious Shield of Public Service Award from the Canadian Public Relations Society for your efforts during and after the 2017 wildfires. And your work in disasters has been described as the gold standard studied by academics across Canada and adopted in California, New Zealand, and Australia. So Tim, a lot of our listeners will know, but just give us some highlights of an emergency operations center or an EOC, what it is and how that fits in the incident command system or the ICS. Yeah, so uh, you'll hear EOC, Emergency Operations Center, quite a bit uh, when there is an ongoing emergency or a large uh, event of some sort. Um, and um, there, there can be multiple EOCs running at the same time so uh, to support a response. So in a case of a wildfire, there may be uh, wildfire operations, law enforcement, First Nation, and the local government. And the local government where, is where I tend to work the most. Um, and uh, each EOC is structured using that what you mentioned there, the incident command system, which is an international standard that sets up the roles and responsibilities of how decisions are made. It's still a very flexible um, to match the incident, and it can grow and expand the team to match what is necessary. So there's a director that leads a team, uh, which includes uh, section chiefs uh, for planning, operations, logistics, finance and admin, uh, liaison risk, and then information, which is what communications and public relations tend to fall into is that information piece. Okay, and I know since I've taken my ICS training, and it's been some years, a, it's a lot like a military operation in the way that it's structured and regimentally the way it behaves. But number mm -hmm. two, the fact the ICS is pretty much a global standard means, regardless of language, regardless of culture, geography, obviously, ideas can be traded back and forth and learnings can be had back and forth. Pretty much right? Yeah, that's right. And and one of the things that I... I try to get people to do because there is a very strict structure within it, as you say. It's like kind of military-like. Um, the 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 important thing is to lean into that structure when you have an incident. And as you lean into it more, what happens is more space opens up, so you can be creative and um, get get the process stuff and get it down really well, so that you can spend more time being creative on the things that you need to. Um, and and then that 
that allows you to really kind of expand your thought. Otherwise, you're just going to be running frantic the entire time. Summer 2023, you were part of three EOCs, which is a ridiculously busy summer. Um, wicked and dangerous forest fires, for the most part, with, with mm. different causes. I know that. Recognizing, you know, there are always people who are going to stay behind, even when it reaches the point where emergency officials say, got to evacuate. What happened that summer of 2023? Yeah, we we um, we certainly saw a lot of fear. Um, there's a lot of fear that surrounds wildfires. Uh, there's a fear of losing everything you own, your home, your business, your community, um, and the fear has become more significant um, as the wildfires have become more dangerous um, and destructive in the past 20 years in Canada. Um, so some people fear government overreach, and some of the some of those same people don't trust the government uh, to save their property from fire or looting. Um, so there's a strong um, disconnect uh, between some residents and their government, and that gap has widened quite substantially in recent years. I think we all know that if we've uh, been working in public relations and paying attention, and um, it's now become a problem, problem in emergencies. Um, what we saw this summer was residents who had experience and resources uh, to stay in evacuation areas, which is common. Um, we usually see a small number of residents will stay behind and, and try to fight fire and they, they do have previous skill and, and they've done this so over decades, um, so they're used to that. But we also had residents that didn't have experience um, and the equipment or resources to survive stay behind, uh, which was a real challenge for us this time because um, while we're clear that if you stay behind, you're agreeing to stay on your property and you must be able be able to sustain yourself um, for the duration of the emergency. Um, some didn't appreciate that when they ran out of food, water, and fuel, that yeah. they couldn't just go and get that um, and come back in and start to claim. I mean, the stores weren't we're, open while all the fires yeah, were going on. That's right. All everything closes down when uh, there's an actual evacuation order in place, and uh, and so um, it's it's a thing. It's a it's a tough balance, right? Because um, Ultimately, the law doesn't allow governments to tell people who, that they just told to legally leave to allow them to then exit and then get back into that same area. So um, you have to remember, we're managing thousands of people that are displaced and taking refuge elsewhere safely yeah. Um, yeah. and supplying all of the operations that's going on. So it's it's a big job. Um, so, yeah, it was it was a real challenge. We had uh, ridiculous amounts of things happening. And I mean, I can share more if you're, you're up for that. Yeah, absolutely. What happened? Yeah. So, um, we, we, we saw a few residents who sabotaged firefighting efforts by removing or stealing equipment. Um, they tampered <laughs> to with save their homes there yeah. to save their property, I assume. Yeah. Yeah. And we're, and right. so we're talking like removing equipment from uh, firefighting equipment from a wooden bridge that was on the only road that was in the area. Um, uh, in another case, we saw some the sabotage of, of equipment. Um, in that case, it was a water source and uh, they were going to put a hole in the water and uh, they thought they were going to improve the water source, but uh, by doing it the way they were going to do it, um, it was going to drain the water source. Um, so lots of strange things. We had protests on um, blockades that we had set up on highways that were closed because it was unsafe. Um, what we were had they people protesting? Try to the fact that emergency officials were there? Like, what are they, they were protesting? protesting? They, yeah, they wanted to. They wanted to reopen. They felt that the highway should be reopened, and they gotcha. wanted to take down the barricade and open the highway. Okay. But the reality was, it wasn't safe for emergency responders to use it, let alone the general public, because the fire was on a cliff above um, the above the the highway. So it was a real challenge. Um, and and another, a couple of weird ones that I. I was just, I, you know, you double take when you hear it the first time, um, but people creating fire breaks with bulldozers on both public and private land. So we had a bulldozer go right by somebody's house without their permission. Um, we had a helicopter bucketing a fire in a no-fly zone. So really a private strange helicopter. stuff. A private helicopter. And uh, so that... That halts all operations when those types of things happen, and uh, we have to make sure it's safe for responders because they're working in the air and on the ground, 
and they need to know that they can do their job safely. How did they treat the, the emergency officials? Was there verbal abuse of any kind that took place? Yeah, there was certainly a lot of confrontation that happened, a lot of tension in the community. Um, and this is in two locations that I was supporting. Um, we saw them, um, some people being approached, uh, emergency responders being approached by different residents um, and being quite aggressive. And um, in some cases, we've had threats of violence. And so it was a, a really um, very difficult time. And I, I take it all back, though, to like, it comes down to low trust. And the, yep. um, you know, it's kind of a mixture of information being put out and being either ignored or not received. Um, and that vicious cycle of low support uh, funding community resources that ultimately help you in a time like this. Um, and then they get angry that those resources aren't there, um, even though they were the same people that maybe were not wanting to support a new fire truck, for example, or a new uh, tool that would help them in a situation like that. You know, what's amazing. And, and I am a Canadian, so maybe I have this view of it, but there's an old joke about what do you say to 10 Canadians to get them out of a swimming pool? You say, okay, everyone, it's time to get out of the pool. Canadians are usually quite, you know, apathetic, nice, calm. We follow the laws. We don't stand up again, but this is happening in, in Canada. So then your job here amidst this turmoil is to communicate or develop communications in a way that results in the action that's so desperately needed. What did you do and what happened? Yeah. Um, I think one of the things is, is I, um, when I get into an EOC, um, I often find that um, the the way in which we practice uh, in a, in that situation when we come from a sort of a regular job and then get into that is we smatter uh, communications to the scattered. Um, so it, it and that that approach has really failed. Um, so you're just spitting out, you know, constant communication and thinking you're getting things out oh, to people. Messages so, you're transmitting, transmitting, transmitting. Yeah. And, yeah, and gotcha. so one of the things I do is I shift around and I, I really do build from strategy down to tactics. So I, you know, I say strategy eats tactics. Um, and um, so for those that haven't worked in large disasters, you may not realize how little time you get in clear headspace uh, to strategically plan. It's like, a, you know, hours if you're lucky. So uh, for me, it's like late at night once everything shut down and, um, you know, I did a lot of my planning between one and three in the morning <laughs> this this time around and um and i spent as much time as i could kind of looking at what residents were posting commenting saying to the media and that's where i kind of discovered a plan that i hoped would work um and um uh, it, and it really did so what was it yeah you're really curious aren't you <laughs> i want to know what you so, did i know you yeah, did tv so, appeals you recorded fire officials and they, you got yeah. some national broadcast out of that. Yeah, absolutely. So that's exactly it. That's one of the things I discovered right away was like, we had a lot of local volunteer firefighters uh, that had a good, strong reputation. Um, so, and they're a great source of information for what's going on in the community as well. So we paired one of our team members, one of my team members with the deputy chief um, who was going into the fire zone daily. And he helped us understand uh, what both the firefighters and the community members uh, who stay behind um, as they gather, they, they, they often gathered in the same location. So he was able to gather intelligence at those locations and help us understand what the local issues were going on. And then we were also looking for stories to tell in a real raw and rough way. Um, much like the content that residents were putting out on social media, um, those that had stayed behind. So our first video was uh, with Deputy Chief Sean Cobro. Um, he spoke with honesty um, about the challenges and appealed for cooperation. Um, and then next we moved in to tell the story of two firefighters who stayed behind the front lines um, and stayed on, you know, fighting the fire uh, the, uh, during the time while they're properties burned down and no scripts for any of them. Um, they were all shot with lower quality video and lower very qual raw. quality audio. Yeah, yeah. Very, very raw. So, um, and that was very, very intentional. And what you, you got national pickup on Canada's national, uh, TV networks. What did yeah, they tell we had, you? Oh, 
Yeah, we had just phenomenal um, uh, results from from media. Um, I've done this work for 20 years now on and off and um, never had this kind of run that we did. So over about a 10 day period, uh, we had four different national news stories on all top uh, all the top big three um, in Canada. And they were like top stories within their, you know, one of their top three stories uh, on each of those networks. And they picked up um, the footage that we put out and the story. They used our messaging, our spokespeople, and and then carried it. And in the one case um, with the video with firefighter Darren, uh, who unfortunately his whole property was destroyed, uh, that mm -hmm. video they took and used it multiple times. And so it ran for over a two-week period on, uh, on one particular network. So it was just uh, great results. And... Uh, and you know we we really started to see a shift in in how people were um, seeing the experience that 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 or experiencing the communications and starting to to understand where we were going and what we wanted uh, them to understand and and where they, we wanted them to go. And I know part of the feedback you got from the networks was that they didn't want slick produced video and audio. They they wanted the raw stuff. In fact, they had semi rejected on a different emergency in a different location they kind of didn't go with a very slick well-produced video that was provided yeah that's right um, they had a beautiful uh, set of videos that were provided by another service and um, they even On commented to incident. me yeah 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 and um, and they they commented to me when we were doing our media trip tour through the area of uh, the fire on the day of the re-entry um, a number of them came up to me which you know top reporters uh, within the country and they said to me they said we really love the rawness of those videos and we couldn't use any of the other stuff that you saw from this other service because it was too hollywood mm -hmm. um, it was mm -hmm. so well done that it just didn't fit to be news and so it was, um, yeah, it was quite a learning from them. I, I was surprised by that. And it was kind of like some of our stuff ended up being a little bit more raw because, um, you know, we, we were capturing those stories as they were happening. So, it, you know, it was, it, we didn't get to the point of actually having the relationship with the person that was on video um, to say, hey, can you put a mic on? Um, so it just, yeah. it just happened. And, and then they allowed us to use that. How other channels, I mean, the television is one thing, radio is another. Can you use newspaper? Are, are websites effective, social media? Do people lose power in some of these emergencies? What are some of the other strategies slash tactics, I guess, that can be used? Yeah, so I that's a that's an area that we also um, did something different than I've done in the past, although it went back to um, some of my earlier work uh, 20 years ago. Um, and like everything we did with, was with intention. So even those video briefings, when we did them, I dressed to match the audience. I made mistakes and I was empathetic uh, um, when we weren't able to tell people what they wanted. So, um, and we did see that immediate shift in sentiment, but we still hadn't gotten where we wanted to. And um, so I rolled this, uh, rolled the dice on a huge gamble. Um, like I said, we had a lot of tension and, and it was, um, you know, one of the people I worked with said to, you know, to me, watch your back. Cause I, I was somebody that was on television, on YouTube all the time. And so everybody knew me wherever, wherever I went. And, um, you know, it said something to me that this person had never said that to me in all the years I've worked with them. Um, and so what we did was we went right into the belly of the dragon, this fire in particular in the shoe swab looked like a dragon when you look at the map of it. And we started to immediately meet people as they re-entered. So um, we did a little bit of a test before at a farmer's market that was just on the outskirts. And then we started by when we people came in, we met them on the road, gave them information. And then we took it another step and we went to all of the little community stores, gas stations, restaurants, set up a, a little booth outside and, and exchanged information. So got information from them and did uh, a bit of an environmental scan and then also were delivering education information. And it was really neat to see it kind of shift people. And I had one particular gentleman that it took three times for him to even come over and say hi. Mm -hmm. And so eventually he did. And he told me, I was so angry at you the first time I saw you. I didn't, I couldn't come over and talk to you, but we eventually did get him over there. And, and that helped uh, to 
to you know slowly build some trust and we were able to show that we were we were human and we were trying to help them last question and tim i might take this out just because we're tight on time here so if you can yeah. be tight that'd be great yeah La last question i mean this is the off season for you now there aren't going to be many wildfires in in in, in Canada in, in the winter, right? There's mm -hmm. precipitation that sticks around. Um, does that mean you don't have to communicate in this fashion or is there preemptive or proactive communication, stakeholder engagement work that you're doing in the off season? Yeah, and so we're, we're looking at what we can do and, and I, I do work as a consultant, so it does come down to what local governments and governments are willing to fund um, when it comes to this work. but. I've been working on a preparedness project that's been funded by the Canadian Red Cross. It's been fascinating. And combined with the experience this summer, um, we've found, you know, where the different gaps are. Um, and also, no, like, I want to make sure I throw in that, like, Meta banned Canadian news just before all of this on all our platforms. So that caused a lot yeah, of troubles for us. Yeah, that's a key point. What's happening right? with Meta and even Google in, in some yeah. countries that people don't have access to information locally that they need. Yeah, that's right. And so the the false information is passing around just fine on on yeah. Meta, but the the <laughs> the actual news is not. So it's a it, right. it's very problematic. I noticed a big difference in that this year. Um, the other thing I want to just throw in is like communications and public relations has greatly expanded. The amount of people working in this business has grown, but at the same time, we've seen a constant decline in trust and reputation. So mm -hmm. I'm trying to twist that around and uh, get get that you know, looking in a better direction. Um, and the tricky part is to do it with less resources because emergencies are really pushing um, things. So um, so I'm building a disaster toolkit for the future. Um, I want to make sure that everybody gets out safely. That's my most important thing. And so I'm looking at what um, effective channels I can use, uh, looking at old tools and new tools that I can bring in and and then see if we can package it all together and make it something that works better. So. Um, Keep an eye on my work. Um, I'll be uh, sharing my knowledge as I go. And uh, yeah, it's it's going to be an interesting year. We do know we're walking in already into another rough season next year. So um, all all of my time and effort is is uh, definitely focused on that. Perfect. Best way to do that is we've got your, your website in the show notes so folks can, can connect with you that way. Tim, thanks for this. Appreciate it, Doug. Thanks a lot. If you'd like to send a message to my guest, Tim Conrad, as I say, his website and his other contact information is in the show notes. Stories and Strategies is a co-production of JGR Communications and Stories and Strategies podcasts. If you like this episode, do us a favor, share it with one friend. Don't forget to leave a rating and a review. Don't forget to leave a rating and a review. Thanks for listening. Stop.